Hello. Nikki. Hey, is that Kevin? This is Kevin. It's Nikki Wise here from the Manic. Hey, how are you, Nikki? I'm okay, thanks. Great. Um, so I uh, thank you so much for agreeing to, to be interviewed by me. That's okay. It's okay. Ex where are you? Where are you based? I am in New York City. I'm uh right. on around Grand Central. That's where our offices are. Very nice. Yeah, indeed. You guys are going to be here in a month, right? Or yeah, quite scary. Yes. <laughs> ten, years, ten years away. It's uh, quite scary, but yeah, we're looking forward to it actually. Excellent, excellent. Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about your new album, Journal for Plague Lovers, which contains okay. lyrics pulled from the notebooks of your uh, long missing member, uh, Richie Edwards. Yeah. Um, can you tell us why you decided to make this album now? Um, I think, in all honesty, I think the driving force initially was James. I think James um, had maybe been looking at the, the notebooks but more than, definitely more than I had. I think um, after our previous album, Send the Way of Tigers, which is a real kind of comeback and a, a good success for us. It, it, was, it was a time, for, I think he felt... Um, just to go off on a tangent, and I know R Richie's lyrics just make us sound like a different band, you know, they are so so brilliant and so awkward and so challenging. Um, maybe James, you know, after all this time wanted, you know, rather than my, <laughs> rather than my lyrics, wanted some more, something more um, oblique and challenging, but um, I think that's where the initial drive came from, really. I don't think it could have happened without Send Away the because that gives the platform to kind of go off kilter again. Going through the, the notebooks, what was your creative process for picking and choosing like which lyrics and which uh, words to use? <clears throat> and that is difficult, you know, it's, it's, you, I guess you feel you're editing a bit, but then when Richie was around we always edited, I and mean, whether it's my lyrics or Richie's lyrics, you know, the band process has always involved change, be it musically or lyrically. So um, obviously certain lyrics that jumped out at you has been just been really good. And then some lent themselves to music, and you know they had to be backed up by a good tune. We didn't want to just do something for the sake of it. You know, we we needed every song to stand. And you know, you just can't predict. You know, it's the beauty of music would be that uh, some songs just uh, fit certain moods and fit certain uh, types of music. So uh, it's hard to. I can't actually nail it down as a, a, a kind of specific. We just let the words guide us as much as we could. Uh, so how did you get uh, Steve Albini to, to produce the record? He's so well known for his work with Nirvana. I mean, we talked about it way back when, um, the, that once uh, summer of 94, I think it was, you know, me and Richie were kind of played in neutral non-stop. Uh, we were fascinated by it. We'd already kn known kind of, of Steve Albini. We were famously, we were once busking in Cardiff, me and James, um, doing some kind of Heck and the Buddy Men and C86 covers and Steve Al. We were only 16 at the time. He was in big black and he walked past us and kind of shook his head and scowled as if we were actually shit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which we always had admired him for. And if we, you know, we weren't even in a band then. We mentioned this to him and he said, yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> that's almost really true. Oh, no. <laughs> but yeah, we just wanted to, um, he works, you know, as everyone knows, he works in such a different way. It's all about analog tapes, all about playing live. And that we really wanted that environment, you know, we thought this music needed to be raw. Um, you know, Steve's drum sounds especially are just, you know, kind of world-renowned, so it worked out really well. It was difficult, I mean, he's not like any other person we've ever worked with. He's not sort of slap you on the back, this is a great song, that was a great solo. He doesn't work like that, but uh, I think we found it really, really good hard work, if that makes sense. What was his, so your process with working with him, like how did that, how different was that from the, the processes that you had been working with in, in prior albums? Oh, I think r radically different. I mean, we didn't, we specifically didn't want someone to arrange songs, you know, add ideas or give bits of arrangement. We didn't want that. We wanted someone just to record us because we'd um, rehearsed the songs really well. We'd, we were kind of really tight, but you've got to be with Steve, otherwise you, you're kind of wasting your time, really. Yeah. Um, we wanted someone to just express the kind of anger, the beauty, uh, the power of the words. And um, other than doing it ourselves, uh, we just thought Steve would be the perfect person to do that. 
just a harness, you know, like the, the first notes of peeled apples, the way it kind of just is there in your face. And which, you know, and it was really easy. To, Steve is very open and upfront, you know, as long as, as, long as the money's there. <laughs> Steve, and he came over to Rockfield um, in Wales which was a bit of a rent for him, I think, but I think he enjoyed it. Um, and we basically did most of the album in three weeks um, during that session. Well, it was a bit less than three, actually, but yeah, Steve had to go gambling on a Saturday. <laughs> so he had to go to London uh, to play poker every Saturday. Uh, so. <laughs> you can't let, get in, can't let work get in the way of your gambling, you know. <laughs> no, um, yeah. But... So when you were recording the album with Steve, did you, did you feel... Any sense of, of Richie's presence in the in the room? I think what we felt was nothing sort of cod spiritual, nothing like that. But we did feel like for a very short, glorious period of time, we almost felt like a four piece again. We felt like we were working under the methods. We kind of worked a bit back then. Um, you know, it was just nice. It was a nice feeling that we were trying to really do justice to these words which we all fell in love with again. We just all remembered how that perfect symmetry we had as the four of us together, all the different ideas, and uh, just the splendor of his words, the amount of ideas that he crams into, you know, short couplets and seems to make it work. So I guess it did feel a bit like a step back in time. You know, we were recording live on an analog desk with Steve Albini with Richie's lyrics. I guess we designed it to be something almost like a time capsule. Hmm. So, uh, how did how did Richie affect you as a as a lyricist? Well, I mean, at the time when we collaborated, I I, I kind of realized early on that uh, if he was he was you know way way in front of me in terms of internalizing kind of despair, lack of hope, even politics, he internalized. I think I was slightly, slightly more able to give something a more social angle, especially if you look at Design for Life and if you tolerate this, you know, a, a more of a more world of view, if you know what I mean. Um, but I just, I was always a fan of his words. I was always quite in awe of his um, breadth, the way, the amount of information he kind of, he read about, he watched. Um, everything was pre-digital, you know, that's with the album as well, that, Richie never had a mobile phone, he never had a computer, he never had a laptop. Hmm. Everything was about reading. Um, and uh, that's what I really admired, really, just this fierce intellect. You know, he, he um, got a really good degree in history from university, he got three A's in his A-levels. He was just, I mean, I was, I was pretty intelligent myself, but I was nowhere near what, what he was. And I just really miss it. When we, when we work on this album, it just made me think that, you know, Perhaps really some of our best work was when, when me and him used to do it together, that you'd have, you know, his element and my element. Perhaps that was the best thing of all, stuff like uh, La Tristessa, Motorcycle Emptiness, you know, they were genuine kind of sort of 50-50 lyrics, really. Right, right. So what was what was Richie like as a person? I mean, we, we all know the, the, the troubled side of Richie. Um, yeah. But what was he... What were some good memories that you had of working with, with Richie? I mean, I've honestly, on, honestly got loads of good memories because I've known him so long. Right. You know, from playing football and rugby and um, going to university, going to school. It goes back, you know, all four of us have known each other since we were pretty much five or six years old. So um, I got, to, you know, just sitting in our room at university, spray painting shirts together, literally just going out and getting pissed. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, starting the band was just so exciting. There's always a, a troubled, dark side to Richie, but never, it never really manifested itself in a really, really dark way until uh, you know the last kind of year. Really, that's when you just felt you couldn't, you know, just sad when you can't reach someone that you know really well. You feel like they're operating on a different level. And um, I did feel like that with Richie. He was just so consumed by art and knowledge. I just couldn't keep up with him. You know, it's just a sad feeling when someone, it just, you just feel like you're losing someone, really. What was the point when he changed? Like, you say the last year or so was when he 
became darker. But what was the what was the real point where you saw that he was that you were losing him? It's really hard to pinpoint a specific time or day. I think after we did a kind of quite an infamous trip to Thailand, uh, which was covered by the enemy, we were one of the kind of the first Western bands to go out there, and it was a huge crowd. We were really surprised because we were only a cult band here at the time, but but it was a really difficult. I felt terrible after it. We all kind of felt dislocated. I don't know. It was, it, like I said, it's well documented in the enemy. And um, from that time on, I think we'd made the Holy Bible. We had a great time making it. But then we realized we had to play the songs every night. And obviously, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of disgust on the songs, especially for Richie, because he had written most of the lyrics. And um, from then on, it just seemed almost like some self-fulfilling prophecy, really, that we just seem to be getting quite disconnected from each other. I think it was one time, really, in the band where we haven't been, we all haven't been totally on the same wavelength, you know. Um, and uh, from from that time on, it was just, I guess it wasn't blazing rows and walking out or hitting each other and stuff like that. It was just, it was worse than that, actually, because, it was, like I said, it was a feeling of just not quite knowing each other like we used to. Uh, we all have heard about uh, what what has happened right now with Oasis. Um, yeah. Uh, how what how do you account for your band's longevity? Even you know you you endured this horrible tragedy. How do you account for the fact that you guys have stayed together for so long? Well, you know, we were talking about this after Oasis. We were trying to think of kind of any bands that have stayed you know, as long as we are from our era, and apart from Radiohead, they've pretty much all split up. Uh, a lot of them have split up and reformed. <laughs> right. You know, um, and then split up again, you yeah. know, like the third from the, and Blur. I, I think it's a, a certain telepathy. I think it's the fact we've known each other for so long. I think that's really out that we knew each other, you know, way before we were in a band. You know, I was in the same class with uh, James right from the first year in school. So I've known Jim since I was five. I mean, he's kind of like my, my longest and closest friend. So I think that's really helped because you, you, we've never really developed huge egos because we all know what we were like in school. So and I think we've also just got a genuine, we genuinely actually love creation. We love the thought of a song of ours somewhere in the world, just turning people on to a different way. Like, I know when the Clash or the Smiths with us, you know, it, it wasn't just love of the band, it was the fact that uh, Alan Ginsberg was singing on a class record, so I discovered Alan Ginsberg, you know. Morrissey would talk about Oscar Wilde, and therefore I discovered Os Oscar Wilde, so I, I think we've done that over the years. I think there's, you know, from Singapore to Finland or wherever, there's always someone that kind of connects with a manic song, and that's, that's a nice feeling. Speaking of your, your, uh, your fan base abroad, um, you guys are doing your first uh, American tour in about 10 years now. It is 10 years. 10 years. Um, what, what, what made you decide to, to, to come back here? It's just something we wanted to do for a long time that just never happened. And also, we felt like we should. I mean, I'm not saying we sell loads of records or anything like that, but we have got a, a small but very, very dedicated U.S. fan base, you know, and I think they... They, they kind of appreciate the fact we come in, I think. Um, and there's just something in us with this record, um, with the Holy Bible, we were about to come to America for a long tour, and obviously Richie disappeared and we never came. And we just felt this time we just need to do it. And I think it'll also it'll allow us to come back again, you know, with another record. I think people are still quite dubious whether we're going to turn up. <laughs> you know, a few, I've looked on a few things and people are like, are you sure they're still going to come? But uh, uh, I'm sure I can assure you we are. And we are looking forward to it. It's like going to a new country for us because it's been such a long time. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I think the, the Cuba stuff did cause us a few problems as well. You know, having the, when we played the gig and met Castro, you know, it did kind of get pulled over a bit at the airport. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> having a big Cuban, you know, stamp on your passport. Oh, yeah, no, that's that's certainly not a good thing to have in this country. <laughs> um, but we are genuinely, you know, I, I'm glad we're, um, we're having a nice taste of the country, east to west, and a bit in the middle as well, so we're looking forward to it. Uh, so you guys really wanted to, 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 to command this country when you were back here in, in, in 99. 
Um, do, yeah. How do you how do you account for certain bands like Radiohead and to a lesser extent Blur and Oasis really yeah. kind of blew up here? And then on the other end, there were some bands that that just couldn't connect. For instance, like Suede certainly came here and tried and and really just couldn't do it. Um, how do you account for like who is able to connect with Americans? Is it just the fact that people come here and just tour their asses off, or what? I don't know. I think it's, there is a bad element. I think things have changed. I think now it, it can come down just to a record on the radio and stuff. Um, it's just never worked for us, I think. There's always been a sense of wrong. We've been in somewhere at the wrong time. I mean, when, at the start with Generation Terrace, where we thought we would, you know, we were kind of semi-punk glam rock. We really thought uh, people would kind of appreciate that in America, but just as we were coming over, you know, grunge was breaking, which was the absolute opposite, which was, you know, very dour, terrible clothes, terrible hair, <laughs> <laughs> you know, good music, but um, so we were kind of, a, I don't know, it just never clicked, so, and I think we realized after, um, especially after going to Japan for the first time and, and Sweden, where we, we were selling, we were going platinum in different countries, and you have to think yourself sometimes, look, you can't force it, you know, it might just, it's not going to happen for us over there, we can't, it'd be brilliant if it did, but, you know, if you can go, you know, go to Sweden and play to 5,000 people a night, or Finland, or Japan, then, then go back to America and play to 600, do you know what I mean? You, you right. Think it's, big, it's a big world out there, and uh, there's plenty of other options, I guess. Absolutely. But you can't tell, I mean, it's like the Killers and Kings Leon, I mean, really, Britain is kind of responsible for breaking them, you know, they really couldn't do anything in America for quite a long time. So Absolutely. It's a kind of role reversal, isn't it? It's very true. It's very true. So, you, you, what, 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 what's your feeling about America right now? Um, coming here, uh, you, you, I'm sure you have some ideas of like how this country uh, has changed and, and the whole Bush and Obama, you know, switch yeah. that has really kind of affected how the rest of the world sees us. So how do you see us? To be honest, I've always been deeply fascinated by the kind of inherent contradictions that, that make up America. It's something, you know, I, I wish we could have been big there because it's the most, you know, kind of, it, 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 there's so many different aspects that you can't help but be stimulated. Mm. Um, I did a big part of my politics degree was on American politics, so, you know, I. I kind of, I've always been interested in that side of it. Doesn't, the presidency is always really, you know, I found uh, almost uh, obsessive about it. And that doesn't matter if it's Bush or Obama or Clinton or whatever. It's just such an amazing office. The Constitution, the TV, you know, I'm quite happy to watch because we get Meet the Press over here. So I'll watch Meet the Press, but I'll also watch the O'Reilly Factor. Cause I like, um, you know, yeah. I'm, I do find it really fascinating and um and just really interesting. The idea that, you know, would be the view of Europe and all that kind of stuff, I think it just comes down to individuals, to be honest. I think, I think if that can be overplayed at times. Right, right. Certainly, uh, the people, the idea that, you know, all of Europe hates us and, you know, you can't go to Europe and people are yeah. throwing bottles at Americans, <laughs> you know, it's we just all, like... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we all know that. That's just rubbish half the time. Absolutely, you? absolutely. And I was on a plane with a lovely American religious woman the other day. Um, you know, she was kind of, she'd gone, she was going to Ireland, and she was obviously deeply religious, the kind of antithesis of me. And we, her husband was a bass player, and all this and that, and we just got on fine. You know, we talked for an hour, and she was, you know, I think, like I said, I think that whole there's always someone burning a flag somewhere, isn't there? You absolutely, know? absolutely. <laughs> Um, but like, like I said, I, I am. I feel connected, and you know, I, I feel interested in, with America in a lot of spheres. You know, at the moment, I'm obsessed with Gore Vidal. But I think his critique of America and the world is just so amusing, as well as you know, stimulating. So, how, how has your how has your 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 political thought changed over the years? I I, I mean, you you you're very well known for being very politically outspoken. Um, but ha, has that become more tempered as you've grown up, or how, is that, how has it changed? I think I'd be lying to you if I said I was as extreme as I was 
you know, when I'm an 18 year old and I want to kind of get rid of the royal family and, <laughs> you know, destroy the House of Lords and all that. I still have those same feelings and those same, same impulses, but I'm not, I never have been dogmatic. I've always been open, like, to all, you know, political ideas. I think it's all, always wrong not to, not, to, not to be open about it. I'm still, I guess my kind of socialist roots will always be with me. Just It's where I grew up. It's why I, I believed in. And, um, but uh, I guess I'm, I'm more, I try to be more positive and less nihilistic, really. I, I guess having seen sometimes the politics, you know, it's got such a dirty name, but you look at the peace process in Ireland, for instance, and it was achieved through politics. It wasn't achieved through anything else. So I still think that when it works, you know, it can achieve great things. You know, there's always, unfortunately, is people's opinion is so low of politicians and politics in general, especially in Britain, that um, it gets a bit frustrating sometimes because, you know, the option is, is almost anarchy and, that, and that's a lot worse. There seems to be a, a, a real sense of malaise in Britain right now. It just seems yeah. like there's people are just so down on the country right now in, in Britain. Yeah. And it's just, it's really interesting to see how that has really shifted over the past, I, I guess, since since the end of Blair's, um, you know, run as prime minister. Um, yeah. what, what are your thoughts on that? And do you think that can change or? I think it can change, but I think it's, I, I do think it's completely, I, I think a lot of it, sorry, is it, cyclical. I think, you know, you have 10 years of economic growth you have kind of the optimism of Blair, which I never felt for. I mean, I was never, we were never invited to, to number 10, like, you know, Blue and Oasis were, even though that year everything must go, you know, we won all the Brit Awards and sold over a million albums. Mm -hmm. But um, there was that optimism. Um, it, was a, it was a good time to be in a band. You know, people were genuinely as, as, um, just excited about guitar music. And obviously we've been going for a while, so it felt nice to be part of sort of ride in the coattails of it, but I think after 10 years of economic growth, of almost decadence, I think uh, there's a generation has grown up not knowing how hard it can be. Um, they know it now because the last year has been so bad. So I think that, that cynicism um, has just come through realization, really, you know, that the, uh, you know, the bigger the, the, the bigger the bubble, the bigger the burst. Mm. Absolutely. And, um, I, I, I kind of, I think we've all been waiting for it for the last three or four years, and uh, it kind of finally, it's permeated now, I agree with you, it's not just um, politics now, it's just, it, there is a general feeling of malaise, you know, it's a perfect, I remember going to Japan in the sort of 92, 93, and I remember I was, I was Japanese photographer saying the same thing about them, that they mm. had all the 80s, and you know, they bought up New York, and all the rest of it, but come 92, 93, they just did stagflation and everything, you know, which seemed shiny and new to them, had just become ordinary. Right. And um, I think I, I think it just happens to a lot of countries, and um, we're going through it now. Right. Uh, one last question. You mentioned uh, uh, being it was a good time to be a guitar band back around the, the Britpop era. Uh, yeah. Do you feel that guitar bands will go the way of blues artists and jazz artists and be, become this real niche? You know what I mean? It's a, it's a really good question, a really scary question. <laughs> <laughs> I do know what you mean. You know, 10 years ago, I would have laughed at you, but it really is a tough time. Um, not in the sense of playing live, I have to say live is, you know, uh, as good as it's ever been for us, really. But, uh, but you know, you look at the charts and you look at what's popular and it's just... It is, it is frightening for a man of my age. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, I think there's one thing Britain is still good at, whatever, you know, we don't, do, we don't build much anymore, we don't export much, but we do still make great entertainment, be that comedy, be it the odd film or, and, uh, and music. And I, I, I've always got faith that we'll come up with something, one, one kind of great band will kind of reignite our innate talent, really. Right. Because, like I said, there's not much else. <laughs> oh, dear. But, you know, those years you've been talking about, from comedy to music to everything was of the highest kind of, be it The Office, 
we had a golden age of comedy of the year as well, you know, and uh, I still think we're capable of great pathos and great irony, and um, along with that, I think a great band will come one day. Great. Thank you so much, Nikki. That's all right, sir. It's a pleasure. Yeah, uh, I hope uh, every, all goes well. Good luck on your tour. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. Webster Hall, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. We recorded um, Lifeblood in, in, uh, quite a bit of it in New York with Tony Visconti in about 2003, I think. Right. And we had a really good time there, and really good two, three or four weeks. So looking forward to coming back. Absolutely. Well, I, I, hope to, I hope to be there to see you guys. Yeah, please, you know, if you need, you know, tickets, guesses, whatever, just get in touch and we'll, we'll sort that out. Fabulous. Thank you so much.